why don't you start by telling us your story and why you feel so passionate about helping people heal? The first of my story is that, you know, I'm the eldest son of Don Miguel Ruiz, and I got to witness Dr. Miguel Ruiz, Apprentice Miguel Ruiz, and then Don Miguel Ruiz. I, I, I got to live through the phases of his journey. And for me, I was like, I grew up in, with a lot of juxtaposition and contrast. Like, uh, I lived in in San Diego, California, and well, Chula Vista, National City area. But I went to school in Tijuana. I also lived in Tijuana for, for a, a good spell of years. So I was always living uh, between the United States and Mexico. So I have that contrast right there. My grandmother was a faith healer, uh, what they say, a curandera. And my father uh, was a general surgeon, a neurosurgeon, and a therapist. And my mother was a dentist. And my uncle's an oncologist. My other uncle's a neurologist. My aunt a psychologist. So There's a lot, a lot of, doctors. of doctors. A mm. lot of doctors on my my mother's side. No, my father's side. Sorry. And my grandmother, their all their mothers, <laughs> is a faith healer. So you have right there a contrast. A, a, a healer of the traditions of our ancestors, Sacurandera, and then all uh, her youngest kids are doctors and uh, medical doctors. That's the uncles I grew up with. So right off the bat, there's a contrast in styles of medication and healing. My grandmother would send some of her patients over to my my father and uncles, and in turn, they also sent their patients over to my grandmother. So it was, it was always this kind of... Uh, uh, view of like whatever it is that you need to, to take care of yourself that's the instrument like don't narrow yourself down to one it has to be this way you look at the plethora of what we have and we use that as well as uh, i grew up uh in the academics you know i went to school for the international baccalaureate in my high school years so i was heavily into the academics and then you have spirituality at home so there's another duality or juxtaposition and I was uh, an apprentice to my family at the age of 14. Um, my brother and I got initiated when I was 14 years old, and my brother was 12 or 11 years old. Uh, my father uh, took us to Mare Grande one day that my, my Jose, my, my brother was going to, my dad was going to take us to Disneyland that day, but Jose says, can we go to Mare Grande, which is a place where my grandmother usually does. It's, uh, it's up in the hills out on the Dulzura, just east of San Diego, in, in the hills up there. And for some reason, Jose wanted to go. So my dad just saw that as like a, a, a sign, of a power sign. We're like, okay, it's time to initiate him. So he took us up to a place called Madre Grande, like I said before. And we went up the hill, which is all in the east county of San Diego. All the mountains are, are saturated by giant boulders, huge, big boulders. So we're walking up this little path surrounded by all these boulders, and we find ourselves in this little cave, a cave that's made by four boulders, just creating this little cave. And that's where my father sits us down and we does the initiation, which is he, we gives, he gives us all seven stones, each uh, five of them reflecting the agreements, and the last two representing death and life. And when we finish the the. The, the initiation, my father goes up to the beginning of that opening of the of the little cave, the stone made cave, and you can see the silhouette on the floor. And my dad puts his head over his uh, his hands over his head and starts uh, waving it back and forth as if it was a snake. And he begins to do that little dance, and the shadow just started moving like a snake. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, the whole valley. You can hear the sounds of rattlesnakes just rattling. And we're like, me and Jose would just look at each other going, just kind of just very nervous. And my dad says, okay, your initiation starts now. You walked up, but now you're going to walk down by yourselves. You know that what's out there. You know there are snakes, but don't let fear stops you from going home. So he walks off. And me and Jose are like, all right, when we were going up, we would just be just walking around, just aimlessly putting our hands where we shouldn't have. Now, we, now that we think about it, we shouldn't have put our hands there. And just nonchalant, uh, happy-go-lucky, uh, willy-nilly, walking up the, uh, the hill. But as we uh, 
got out of the cave, now we're a lot more cautious. We're holding each other's hands and we're walking slowly down the hill. And it's our first initiation to facing our fear, you know, the, the fear that we project onto the world. And breaking through that barrier, breaking through that veil of the irrational fear that's combined with real fear. So that's the beginning of, my, of our journey, the facing fear and letting us know that we can transcend it, we can engage it. Fear, the function of fear is to keep us safe. So it's an ally. But when we abuse fear, like we abuse alcohol and drugs, it's the thing that keeps us stuck in life. And we would not live or make a choice if we let irrational fear creep into our life. So that was the whole task, to learn how to keep moving and let life teach us and guide us the way. At that point, my father says, good, once we've reached the bottom, Miguel, you're going to be apprenticing your grandmother. And you're going to help her translate everything into English because she spoke nothing but Spanish. So I apprenticed with my grandmother for 10 years. And I learned how to meditate. I learned how to pray. I learned how all these uh, traditions uh, that she has been sharing and giving. But mostly healing. We heal with our own permission. We heal with our ability to engage. So in helping my grandmother help so many people throughout all these years, I've learned that we heal with our permission. And my grandmother was the instrument by which people healed, just like my uncles and my father were as doctors. And then my father, when I graduated college, because that's when he told me, like, he'll intensify my training once I graduate college. He really began to be more, not, not just diligent, but more ruthless with the teaching and that's when i re began to see things in a totally different way become alive face death by learning how to become alive face fear that way so i had this moment of clarity where i became aware of all our teachings and i felt in such a peace with myself in that power journey to teotihuacan where Every, I saw everything as beautiful. Like uh, my father would call it the the breaking the the assemblage point, where all of a sudden you let go of the filter that blinds you, that distorts how you see the world, and you see life as is, which is beautiful. And I felt this enormous peace in uh, one of these ceremonies. And then I would go home, and my mind was still thought I was up here. You know, like I, I came home, and I was at peace with so many things, but as time progressed, things began to change. And even though I thought I was here, my belief system just started taking me down, 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 until I completely broke apart. Like my father had a, a, a massive heart attack. Uh, I lost some someone I loved very much. And then the biggest break, heartbreak of all was, I wasn't who I pretended to be. And everything broke, and at that moment, I was about 26, 27 years old at this point. 26, actually. And I picked up the book, The Four Agreements, for the first time. Now, I had picked it up before. I bought the book when it first came out when I was 21 years old. I bought the book in Berkeley, California. And I began to read it. And around page three, I put the book down because it was my dad telling me what to do all over again. It's mm -hmm. one of the things that happens when you grow up in a family like this. Yeah. As a kid, we basically perceive it as my father's telling me what to do all over again. And I love my grandmother and I listened to the teachings, but I had I understood it conceptually or intellectually, but I hadn't had the aha moment with it yet. Until that moment where I realized I I I needed help. I needed to heal myself. I, I really just because you were born into this family doesn't mean you're not going to hit rock bottom. You're going to hit it. In fact, that's the whole point. You hit that rock bottom at that moment of clarity. And you decide to make a shift. You know, Like I say in my book, The Mastery of Self, a moment of clarity without any action is just a thought that passes in the wind. But a moment of clarity followed by action becomes a pivotal moment in our life. So it's a moment 
in my life where I picked up the four agreements again and read it the way everyone has read it, sees it, which is I, I, I'm using it to help myself. And that's when I began to apply all everything my grandmother taught me, everything my father taught me to heal, to let go, to give myself the permission. For example, uh, up until that point, uh, every relationship I was in when we broke up, what I was taught by my friends was to, uh, as soon as, well, the best way to uh, heal from a breakup is to get into a new relationship, right? And uh, I believe that when I was young and all that did was create a freight train of stuff that I hadn't dealt with, processed or engaged. It's just, it just built up and built up and built. And imagine a, a freight train that with every new relationship, you just add more or another a caboose, another, another little cart to it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just adding to the bulk. And then one day it just comes crashing down. So I, a part of the healing was take some time off from dating anyone giving myself time to heal and honor myself. This hurts. This is terrible. This is, and really begin to acknowledge myself, you know, kind of like a, a, a drug addict or alcoholic that goes to a, a meeting and says, hello, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic uh, or I do drugs. For me, it's hello. My name is Miguel Ruiz Jr. And I do take things personal. I do make assumptions. Sometimes I'm not impeccable with the word. Sometimes mm-hmm. I'm not skeptical at all. I buy hook, line, and sinker, and sometimes I don't do my best. Just ask my wife. She is my witness. Yeah. It's the moment where I stop pretending to be something I am not. And in order to heal, it starts with acknowledging and honoring yourself. It's basically the basis of unconditional love. You see, conditional love only sees what it wants to see. And unconditional love is seeing life as a whole, seeing the whole yin and yang. And that's when I began to really begin to apply the teachings. And my father needed help. So I helped him because of his heart heart attack. You know, he didn't have enough energy to finish a class. So I would go up there and help him. You know, he would give me that look and I would go up and talk. And then I look back and he not, yes, I can, I can start or no, give me more, more time. And that's how I began. So when I first started teaching, I was like a cover band, you know, uh, <laughs> covering the classics, covering yeah. the four agreements yeah. and repeating what I had learned from my grandmother and grand and my father. And then little by little, as life began to teach me, I began to add my own stuff. And that's when I, I stopped being a cover band and I started teaching how I inter- understood and interpreted the teachings. At this point, I had started dating again. I met my wife uh, now of 20 years now. And I did this, all this journey to process of healing. And that's when I became aware, like the really understood the whole, we heal with our own permission. Something my grandmother taught, taught me is like, in order, let me put it this way. Jose, my brother, as you, as you was in your show says, has a beautiful quote in the Toltec tradition. There's nothing to learn, but to unlearn. I love that phrase. So for me, I go, well, what do I unlearn? And the answer was anything that stops me from giving myself the permission to heal. And that's it. That's that's the part where I, I had that aha moment and I kept moving forward. So that's where I became aware that the job I do is to help people heal from the wounds that conditional love left in their hearts and minds through the form of their domestication or conditioning. And that's what I do. So for me, that's the healing I give. I don't heal physically like my fathers and my uncles. I don't heal like a a faith healer like my grandmother. I heal in my own unique way by being a mirror and reflecting a story that helped me heal. And if it resonates with you, it might help you as well.